Hello everyone, I uh, wanted to come up with another update. Uh, just talking about some of the um, news that happened during the week, both um, just global news and uh, also give a bit of a recap of what I've done on the channel for the last week. Um, so let's start with the news. I, I wanted to highlight a few of the what I view as sort of the top stories of the week. Um, I've picked three stories I'm going to go into to some level of depth and I'll include links in the description below this video for uh, uh, some of the some of the videos and documents that I'm going to bring up here uh, so if you can go want to go and take a look at them yourself you can as well as uh, some other suggested uh, links that I might not get to in the actual video uh, just if you want to go and learn some more about some of the topics I'm going to talk about today so uh, so starting with the top news of the day, um, I'm going to use my trusty Google Maps here to kind of zoom in on the parts of the world. And today we're starting with the United States um, and specifically, of course, uh, Washington, D.C., right there. Um, so the big story that I'm calling this uh, the, for the week out of the States is this indictment that came out uh, the the uh, Department of Justice uh, issued for uh, against I think it's 13 Russian uh, individuals um, and an organization as well uh, that in relation to the uh, attempts by the Russians to uh, affect the outcome of the uh, 2016 presidential election. Um, this is a very complex story, and I'm not I don't have time to go into the full background here, but I am expecting that most people are familiar with both the current political situation of, of the United States as well as this particular uh, Mueller in, uh, 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 investigation that's going into the uh, attempts uh, that the Russians made, and some would argue successful attempts in uh affecting the outcome of the American election and to put uh, Donald Trump in charge. Um, so this is one of the, the, the so the investigation has let, led to a number of um, either charges being lay, uh, filed uh, like this one here, like this document here, or um, guilty pleas being obtained with a couple of, with a number of key uh, individuals that were involved in the Trump campaign. Um, this is an interesting um, indictment just because it's 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 related to that investigation, but it's specifically targeting the Russian aspect of this of this problem, and that the the Russian government through uh, organizations, sort of shell organizations like the one that's laid out in this document, um, were using uh, things like social media, uh, so creating. Uh, sensationalist posts in social media to uh, to achieve a couple of outcomes as well as uh, in this or in this document they lay out uh, that they organize rallies they actually had ind Russian individuals masquerading as US citizens interacting with other US citizens well, well interacting with actual US citizens uh, including some members of uh, some uh, of political organizations to uh, organize and hold rallies in again it's, it's an, it was a very complex organization uh, uh, operation here to try and uh, like I said subvert the the electoral process and and the two things that they seem to be doing that, that this is the picture that seems to be coming out of this whole operation of how they work is basically they were targeting two ends of the political spectrum with very different messages uh, on the uh, conservative side on the Republican side in the states, they were heavily pro uh, promoting Donald Trump and and doing activities that would shine a positive light on Donald Trump and the Donald Donald Trump campaign. On the uh, left side, they were doing lots of viral video and and viral posts uh, and and social media manipulation in in an attempt to portray Hillary Clinton in a negative light as well as elevate uh, Bernie Sanders in particular where they were very much trying to uh, cre you know, increase the, uh, the, the 
dissatisfaction with the status quo of the of the of the American the American population's dissatisfaction with the status quo, as well as also to see distrust in the systems of democracy. So the political process, the electoral process, and the media, the the, the mainstream media and even alternative media. Uh, to try and muddy the waters as much as possible and make people trust all of those important or systems uh, uh, of our society uh, to, to cast doubt and aspersions on them, to, to try, try and seed distrust. Um, and this is, again, it's having tangible outcomes. So this is an incredibly pressing story. So that said, there was some cursory coverage because this broke, I think, uh, this was filed do they have a date stamp on here there you go 216 so this was filed just on friday it's just yesterday um so the media coverage because they were getting out quick to try and um uh, to to get this out on uh, out to the press real quickly most of it was pretty much just a summary of the of the first part of the document and and there wasn't a whole lot of detail uh that said if you would like to go and read this document yourself it is available online i will put a link down in the description and uh, well, I'm going to read just a little bit of the the, um, the introduction here because to maybe tease you a little bit and get you in, interested in possibly going and reading more of this yourself. Or and I may I'm going to try and read through this in the next few days. This is this is a pretty lengthy document. You can see the scroll bar here. Uh, I, just scrolling down a little bit of page, you can see I'm not moving very much. So there are a lot of pages in the, oh, 37 pages according to this document header here. Uh, so I'm going to try and read through this in a couple of days. I'm not going to rush to it, um, and I'll, I'll pay attention to see how the coverage uh, evolves on this subject. And uh, but I'm going to I wanted to highlight some of the interesting points in here. Just like I said, it's interesting here. So um, starting with the here's a list of the names of specific individuals, and some of those will be listed further down in the document. Um, but essentially, the defendants worked in various capacities to carry out defendant organizations' interference operations targeting the, the United States. From in or around 2014 to the present, defendants knowingly and intentionally conspired with each other and with persons known and unknown to the grand jury to defraud the United States by impairing, obstructing, and defeating the lawful functions of the government through fraud and deceit for the purpose of interfering with the U.S. political and electoral process, including the presidential election of 2016. So again, this is talking about an ongoing operation, or at least one that was up, up until relatively recently, this particular organization was active well past the election. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, we can assume that this type of effort is still ongoing in other means by, the, uh, by Russia and, and, and probably other actors on the, on the global stage as well. Um, so... The next paragraph is beginning as early as 2014, defendant organization began operations to interfere with the U.S. political system, including the 2016 presidential uh, U.S. presidential election. Um, the organization received funding for its operation from uh, this specific defendant and the companies he controlled, including Concord Management and Consulting, LLC, and Concord Catering. Um, now, this these are tied to it. I'm guessing this is the Evgeny... Evgeny uh, I, I'm really bad with Russian names, but Prigozhin, I'm guessing, Prigozhin. Uh, he, he is, I believe, this is the individual that is uh, Putin's caterer, because uh, they do mention his Concord catering. I'm, I'm guessing that I think this might be the individual, but essentially uh, this seems to be a common operation by the Russians in that, he's got, that Putin has a number of Oligarchs, so rich, essentially rich individuals, uh, rich businessmen of different types, in close ties with the Russian government, that get funding from the Russian government to do any number of activities. Some of which are legal, and some of them, which looks like, are probably not. Um, anyway, uh, so the defendant uh, organization spent significant funds to further uh, the operations and to pay the remaining defendants, along with other uncharged uh, organization employees, salaries, and bonuses for their work. So they set up a full-blown company, essentially, to do this social media manipulation and mining. Um, so, so defendants posing as U.S. persons and creating false U.S. personas operated social media pages and groups designed to attract U.S. audiences. These groups and pages, which address divisive U.S. politics and, so and social issues, falsely claim to be controlled by U.S. activists when, in fact, they were controlled by defendants. So this is one of the key um, points that 
you know, it's if you know, it's not so much the fact that they're speaking out about certain issues, it's the fact that they are, you know, known foreign agents masquerading as 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 U.S. agents or U.S. activists um, to try and paint a story. So it, it's again, it's very, uh, it's a deception. It's 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 a, a whole organization uh, around trying to push a uh, a a a political message, a specific political message, for using deception. Um, they also stole the identities of real U.S. persons to post on organization-controlled social media accounts, and over time, these social media. So this is one I. I, this one particular sentence stuck out to me. They also use the stolen identities of real U.S. persons to post on organization-controlled social media accounts. I wonder what those organization-controlled social media accounts are, and perhaps they're outlined further down in the document. But it's just interesting to see that. So they were also, again, they were stealing individuals' identities. They were they were masquerading as real people in certain situations to get past any sort of organization-controlled security, allowing them to gain to be able to post content with a level of trust well above what they should have. Um, and well, to masquerade again as messages coming from, you know, certain organizations, uh, some legitimate organizations, would be my guess, uh, including, I know there's a Tennessee Republicans there's a no, noted further down. There's a, there was an organ, there was an organization that they created that was masquerading as the Tennessee Republican and, and that organization, that, that organization's Twitter account, this fake organization's Twitter account was retweeted by even a number of individuals in the Trump organization. So um, anyway, um, let's also go on. The certain defendants travel to the United States under false pretenses for the purpose of collecting inf- intelligence to inform defendants' operations. Uh, they also procured and used computer infrastructure based partly in the U.S. to hide the Russian origin. So again, they set up shop in the United States, or at least they set up some computers in the United States so that uh, you know it wasn't obvious that the information being pushed through those systems was coming from Russia directly. You know, it was housed in the United States. It would look like it was a United States origin. Um, and then what was the other thing that I wanted to... There was one other thing. I'll skip through some of this, I think. But there was one in particular. I think it maybe is in the counts. Um, where they made a specific reference, just this just stuck out at me. Um, doo, doo, doo. They said this is a fascinating document to sort of read through. Oh, here it is, right here. Um, so this is again talking about the same. Oh, this is the same guy, the head of the Concord. Uh, he approved and supported the organization's operations and defendants and the co-conspirators, and were aware of this gentleman's role, Prigozhin. Uh, for example, on or about May 29, 2016, defendants and the co-conspirators through an organization-controlled social media account arranged for a real U.S. person to stand in front of the White House in the District of Columbia under false pretenses at, to hold a sign that read, read uh, Happy 55th Birthday, Dear Boss. Defendants and their co-conspirators informed the real U.S. person that the sign was for someone who is a leader here and our boss, our funder. Um... Prigozhin's Russian passport identifies his date of birth as June 1st, 1961. So there's a couple of things that they're making clear in this point. One, uh, 1961, if you add 55 years to that, um, that would put you at uh, 2016? No, what would that be? 55 years. Um, oh, anyway, it's interesting. Um I'm kind of, I, sorry, I was just noticing the date there. So are they, I'm not trying sure. I'm not sure if they're trying to say that the dates match or don't match. Because do I think that's 2016, which means that would actually match. But that said, um, I would like to know. This is the thing I really wanted to highlight. Happy 55th birthday, dear boss. So there's an individual under false pretenses holding a sign that says "Happy 55th birthday, dear boss" in front of the White House. I, I try to search for that text, and I even did Happy 55th Birthday, Dear Boss, and White House to see if I could do an image search on Google to pop this up, and I couldn't find it. But if anybody happens to know specifically what this is referring to, I'd, be, I'd love to find this original image. My guess, just again, trying to interpret this, legal documents, of course, are, are not always meant to lay things out step by step for the layperson. It might be something that's of import to the legal organization, um, but... Like I said, I just, I'm guessing that this was used. I want, I'm just curious who the indi- the U.S. person, the real U.S. person is. Um, but given the... So the little sleuth thing I did was that I believe Obama at the time of this was 
done was 55. So I'm guessing that this has something. This was something that was posted to conservative uh, social media source uh, to appeal to conservative social media uh, sources that would somehow defame Obama, Obama and the Democrats. But um, I'm not sure. I, like I said, I just found that was this is such a specific detail. I'd love to know more, and I'd love to try and find that image. But anyway, like that it's things like that, and this is only on page. Uh, seven of 37 so I'm really interested to kind of read through this and see what are the little nuggets of information I can find and if you are too I will again put the link down below okay let's move on to the next story here we're going to leave North America and we're going to head over to Europe uh, specifically to Germany and Munich uh, which Munich is down here so in Munich right now this weekend we've got the Munich Security Conference going on. Um, this is an annual conference. There are a lot of world leaders and uh, heads of defense departments that show up to this conference and attend a number of lectures and there's discussion. And it's a place for a lot of political conversation about security, just general global security um, in, in in a centralized spot. So, uh, so this is a high diplomatic uh, visibility uh, event. It's also streamed online uh, the, at this website, the securityconference.de. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem that they live stream to YouTube. They do have a YouTube ch uh, channel though, and it looks like they do post at least some of the video on the YouTube channel. Well, I don't know if they necessarily post the contents of the lectures on YouTube. I did seem to recall I didn't see that last time I was on there. Um, but that said, I will put a link to this website in the description as well as a link specifically to the media library where you can go and watch individual videos. Um, but basically, to give you a little shortcut, if you go to activities menu and click Munich Security Conference, there's a couple ways to get to it, but I found this is the easiest. Click that. And then this will bring us to the Munich Security Conference, and there's a separate tab for each year. Click on the, the 2018 one to the top of the page. And this will give you a link to the videos and photos. So this is where you can go and find videos. Uh, but the other thing you can go is you can go down to uh, Agenda and Participants, and from there, uh, well, there's also a link to the live broadcast as well, but you can go and download a PDF of the agenda, or you can just view and see what's on here. So right now we're on Saturday, and uh, let's see, 133 here. I expect there's not a whole lot unless there's something late in the evening that might be going on right now. There's some panel discussions. So some of those might be live streaming right now. Um, but you can go back and into the uh, media library. Uh, let me just backtrace here and go to the uh, videos and photos. Um, oh, <laughs> bad linking. All right. This doesn't look like, I'm guessing, I wonder if this is a WordPress site. This looks like a WordPress type of thing, but that shouldn't be a dead link. All right, let's go back to the homepage. I'll show you how you can get to the live source. You go to Media Library and click that. Uh, you can see, again, Munich Security Conference 2018. Click on that, and that will bring you to the list of videos and photos. By default, it shows you photos and videos. It's an all, but you can click up here and just click Video, and it will only show you the video that they've gotten. So here's all the different lectures and present and uh, individual speakers um, speaking. And so again, you can see Theresa May is here. Um, uh, Sergei Lavrov from Russia, uh, a number of other individuals again from different countries, but probably people I just don't recognize off the top of my head. Uh, so anyway, but you can go and watch these. Um, I'll play a little clip of the welcoming remarks, um, just because again, this is a fascinating conference going on right now, considering all the conflict that's going on on the world. Um, right now um, with things going on around Syria and the Middle East as well as some major political upsets going on in numerous countries in Africa. Um, this is a really, uh, it's a dangerous time and they, in his address he talks about how the world is at the brink of a major conflict between some of these big powers and, and a lot of that I would expect is coming out of Syria and the Middle East. Um, because there's a lot of countries with active troops in the region all starting to take pot shots at each other. Uh, that's never good. So, and and what they call for a, uh, he calls in this in this uh, speech for a lot of 
um, effort, not just in accentuating the positive, but also in laying out frameworks for taking real measurable steps backward from this brink. Uh, but let's just play a little bit of the video and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come back in after this. Uh, oh yeah, and I'm going to have to skip ahead here because uh, there's a bunch of preamble here. Well, they're just kind of setting things up. Um, and I don't know why it's cut there now. I'll do a full screen once this loads up. Here we are. We have too many unresolved crises, instabilities, and conflicts. Oh, did I pause it? I did. Oh, no, I didn't. I just, I'm having some internet issues. In fact, I think that if this conference hadn't been created 54 years ago, today would be an important moment to start it. So let us use this weekend to promote peace and security as best we can. Hmm. And it won't, won't happen if you, the leaders, the foreign ministers, the heads of state, the defense ministers, the national security advisors, etc., if you don't make your personal contribution. I've been asked, is the situation really that bad? A few days ago, famous Harvard professor Steven Pinker wrote in the Wall Street Journal, and I quote, you can always fool yourself into seeing a decline if you compare rose-tinted images of the past with bleeding headlines of the present. Does he have a point? Yes and no. Yes, it's true. The world has made remarkable progress. Improvements in fighting poverty and disease. Many more people are able to live a life in dignity today than maybe 20 or 40 years ago. But then again, democracy and freedom, the values we here in the West value most are in decline, are under threat. The West, our societies, appear to be weaker than in the past. The international order itself, established in the post-World War period, is at risk the number of refugees and IDPs, ladies and gentlemen, is simply appalling. So I think the truth is progress, even significant progress, and danger, and significant risk can spread at the same time. They are not mutually exclusive. This is why we should not simply spread doom and gloom. I agree with those who argue that point. But it would also be foolish to downplay the warning signs. My friends, the warning signs are flashing in bright red. Okay, I'm gonna stop it right there, but as you can tell, tone of the opening remark this is, these were the first remarks of the conference and uh, those are sobering comments so like I said it's a very interesting time dangerous time but uh, it's important that we shed light on the discussions that are going on and this is again these are remarks that aren't addressed generally to the public these are addressed to foreign dignitaries to like I said, there are national leaders and both, you know, heads of state as well as heads of defense ministries uh, in this audience. And these are the people he's talking to. And that's very, very strong language. 
So anyway, uh, like I said, this conference goes on for the whole weekend. Um, it will be tomorrow will be the last day. So if you want to watch some of the live stream tomorrow, will be your last chance to do so. But if you, you can always come back and onto this website and and take a look at the video and and watch it at your own leisure. I'm gonna try and take a selective approach at this at some point over the week, just to inform myself. And if I find anything interesting, I'll bring it onto the channel. Excuse me. Okay, uh, so let's leave. Uh, Europe now um, and let's focus on the two biggest areas of uh, conflict and controversy going on in the world um, one I'm gonna just highlight Syria right now so um, I don't there wasn't I don't recall there being a significant amount of news coming out of the issues uh, from this specific week um, I'm sure there were some daily updates, but effectively right now we've got Turkey sending troops into Syria. Let me zoom in a little bit here. They're in this area of Syria where they're trying to, they view this Kurdish force, resistance force, as enemies and terrorists. Even though these these groups were helping, working with the United States to fight against ISIS in that conflict, which, you know, they've, that seems to have now moved away but now that ISIS is sort of on the back burner in retreat at least in Syria um, you've all the knives are out and everybody's kind of fighting for their own issues so essentially uh, so one thing that happened was of course like I said that's ongoing right now there's Turkish troops in Syria uh, trying to take rest certain cities in this area in, in this part of Syria uh, away from these Kurd Kurdish fighters uh, now, the Kurds are a ethnic group that are, this is their native region, essentially this mountainous area here um, in that borders uh, around, you know, they, it, it may even include parts of Georgia and Armenia, certainly includes a, this western part of, uh, sorry, eastern part of Turkey, the northern part of Syria, the northern part of Iraq, and the western part, this northwestern part of Iran. Um, this is their original territory and before World War One, this was all the Ottoman Empire and it was after World War One and that this kind of all got carved up into the borders and these borders weren't done with respect to the individuals living there they were created by what by well Western organization Western countries England and France and Germany and you know a lot of the European powers were the ones who decided these political lines and, and, and many of the conflicts that have ris arisen in the last hundred years are or due to these decisions that were made so long ago without real proper concern. Um, so anyway, the Kurds have been wanting their own state because they don't view themselves as the same as the Turkish groups that live over here or other Syrians or other Iraqis or other Iranians. And so this is another big complicated wrinkle. But anyway, so that's why Turkey is there. Iran, on the other hand, was flew a drone, uh, has presence in Syria as well, and they had a drone penetrate into Israeli airspace and was shot down. Uh, that was last week, I believe. Uh, and Israel in retaliation sent strikes into Iranian troops in Syria. Um, and of course, Russia and Syria, the Syrian government, are working as well to try and uh, you know wrest power away from ISIS, but. You know they've got their own interests, so it's this is a very complex situation with a lot of different parties, all of them with grudges against each other, going back decades, um, if not centuries in some ways, um, when you're dealing with religious differences. So it, it goes, it's a mess. Uh, but the other area I wanted to focus on was Africa, and Africa. There's a number of countries that are going some through some fairly significant changes right now. Um, specifically South Africa, um, this week, their head of state stepped down and, uh, finally there was a lot of pressure on him to step down. Uh, I believe it's, it's Duma, uh, I think I'm still learning African politics. So I apologize to any people that have an interest in know this better than I do. If I butcher names or, uh, locations, I'm just still trying to learn, but basically so there was a big lot of pressure. It was his own party that asked that, re, that wanted him to step down, and he was he's been a controversial figure in South Africa. Uh, if you happen to watch the uh, Daily Show, with Trevor Noah, Trevor Noah is from South Africa, and he's talked on numerous occasions about how bad this individual was as head of state, and he even compared many of the things that Trump does to the things that this guy did. So hopefully that's a good 
sign for South Africa. I don't know about the person who's replacing him. Uh, or the I expect there's still going to be a lot of the same problems just because you get rid of the top of the problem doesn't mean that the head of the state doesn't mean that all the people that he supported on to keep him in power aren't going to keep doing the same thing. So, um, but at least it's a it's a positive change regardless of how positive we'll have to see. But it's a positive change in South Africa. Likewise, in Ethiopia right now, uh, the head of state is uh, just stepped down this week as well. Um, again, under intense pressure, uh, and so this is also an, issue, an area that's going to be kind of interesting. But the area I wanted to focus in was Kenya. I've been talking about it a couple of times, and it's been um, one of the more fascinating studies for me. I, I don't, again, I, as I said, up until I started doing this project, I didn't have a lot of knowledge of African politics. I knew about Africa's geography and some of its history, but certainly not the current state of politics. Uh, and having access to so many news sources out of Africa makes it a really interesting study uh, spot for me, uh, just because I can inform myself all, and on the day to day quite a lot. In Kenya, in particular, um, I, I want to. I, the press in Kenya is very uh, empowering. It's got a uh, four 24 hour TV channels. Most of them do a large amount of news coverage. Uh, KTN is my favorite of the four. Uh, but uh, uh, NTV as well had does some good stuff as well as um, uh, oh what's the other one Citizen TV I think it's so all three of them those three and the other one uh, is a is not is a non English channel so I don't tend to poke in on that one very often because I don't understand what they're saying uh, but that said um, so the big polit political issue that are going on that's going on in Kenya right now is uh, this power struggle between the on one side you have the head the head the I think he's president in Kenya uh, but the head of state in Kenya uh, and on the other you have the news media and the judicial system um, Kenya adopted a new constitution in 2010 um, which looks to be modeled much off of the American one but certainly it it it, it seems to have uh, you know, much solidified in, in, in law the the power of the judicial system separate from the executive, which is the, you know, the political system. Uh, and, and so, but there, it's a fledgling system and there's still, you know, this is a country that's had a very checkered past as far as leadership is concerned and, and corruption has been a long-term issue with Kenya going back to uh, when it escaped from colonialism. And even back then, uh, I mean, it, it's still a country that's shaped by colonialism. The again, political lines in East Africa were drawn by individuals that weren't East African. So, again, you probably have issues around the similar sort of thing where you'll have different tribal groups that don't see eye to eye and would normally be warring or forced into the same political process. Um, I do know that just from some of the videos I've watched in KTN that the western half of the country is far more developed than the eastern half. half. This is a much more pastoral um, and you know essentially substance, subsistence living, whereas here we have a lot more economy and a lot more uh, industrial uh, cities and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then uh, even within this western half, you have tribal groups. Or it's, it's not a homogenous group. You have different tribes down in the south versus the ones over on the west and, the, and they represent essentially different political parties um, so when one tribe's in power the other tribe is going to be oppressed to some degree um, in addition to that of course Kenya also has to deal with its neighbors and Somalia is, is a very lawless country in many ways there's a lot of instability obviously in Somalia Ethiopia we, as we just saw there's some issues with Ethiopia uh, Uganda has corruption issues uh, Tanzania I actually haven't seen much news out of um, but there has been some issues with Burundi has cor corruption going on right now South Sudan again is another area but you can see these ones these little dotted lines these are contested borders so obviously there's issues with South Sudan I know Sudan as general has is an unstable area of, of Africa as well so Kenya's got a lot of not just internal issues but you know regional political issues as well that have to deal with so but that said the media is really enheartening. It's really, uh, it's been one of the more bright spots for me, especially, like I said, KTN, 
Um, but from all the discussion that happens is a lot more naked. It's not as polished as some of the more Western media sources because they don't one they don't have the funding, they don't have the audience, and uh, they don't have the the training probably either. But because it's a raw source, you tend to get a lot more of honest speaking. Um, in particular, I wanted to play a video. Um, this is a commentary. It's just a three minute commentary. I'll play the thing probably in its entirety. Uh, by one of the uh, reporters at KTN, and it's a—I I just found it such an interesting appeal that is applicable to people, uh, no matter where you are. It, it, I mean, she's talking to the Kenyan audience, but in many ways, these are questions that we should all be asking ourselves. Uh, so, anyway, let me just play this, and we'll we'll come back. <laughs> This week, I will start with a famous quote from the great Albert Einstein, the German-born theoretical physicist who once said the following about questions. He said, and I quote, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes, end of quote. And so tonight on my take, I will ask a question. Just what is the truth? Let me say from the onset that I believe that this is the proper question to ask in Kenya today. That if we do nothing else this year, could we at least answer this question? And I mean, seek it, the truth that is, in all its forms, raw, bitter, tough, Folks, this is the only way out if we're to move forward as a nation and that quest for the truth. Now, here are some tough questions that we must answer. Are we really a nation? Do we all feel part of the whole? Have some communities been neglected, discriminated against by successive administrations? Or at least, do they feel that way? Are we a functioning democracy? Do we respect the law? Do we want to? What is a court order? These questions and so many more must be asked of everyone, including the media. Is the media the most trusted institution in the country? Why not? What happened? Do our religious leaders hold themselves, the political class, and their membership accountable? We must answer these and many more questions, truthfully, if we're to make any progress in this country. Now, it'll make us angry, it'll be painful, it'll even be uncomfortable. But it will be the start of the new Kenya, away from the usual pretenses of normalcy. While everyone plays the proverbial dangerous cards under the table, 50 years after the colonialists left the country. At this moment, I dare say, we're merely putting a band-aid over the boil, over the truth. But it is festering, becoming septic by the day. So let's lance the boil, get out all the pus, the germs. It'll be painful, but it will be the first step in defining Kenya beyond just a geographical boundary that was set so arbitrarily by people who knew nearly next to nothing about the people in it. For what, for that is what we have now. Unwilling cohabitants trapped in the same geographical space by a historical accident. And that tonight, is my take. So, like I said, I just found that inspiring um, in many ways. Um, and that's the type of stuff that I quite enjoy about that channel, uh, just because they're struggling with this question. And, and so I don't think I, I, list, I clearly laid out the issue of, about politically what's going on. But so the election that happened last year, there was an election in Kenya in the summertime that had to get rerun because of discrepancies in the process. And when the election was rerun in the fall, the opposition party uh, boycotted it in protest because they didn't think it was going to be any different. And so the incumbent won again, and they're in power. That said, um, a few weeks ago in January... Um, there was a 
ceremony, a, a mock inauguration of the head of the opposition as the people's president of Kenya. Uh, it was a protest. It was highly visible. There were thousands of people that attended it. And the all the news channels, all the television stations in Kenya covered it live. And this enraged the president. Um, and what he did was very undemocratic. Essentially took all four television stations off of the air for several days. Um, and he took the individual uh, whose name is Maguna Maguna, who was the lawyer who uh, oversaw the, this mock ceremony. He was the one who anointed uh, the head of the opposition as the people's president. Um, he was taken into custody and was shuffled around Kenya for a number of days while the courts were sending order after order to the president saying, you have to release this man, you have to set him free, there is no justification for his capture. Uh, and in or, in, they kept, uh, and even individuals from the Canadian embassy, because this individual, individual, Maguna Maguna, I'll get to this interview in a second here, but he um, is a dual citizen of Canada and Kenya. He's a lawyer. Um, and the, even, uh, the Canadian embassy sent officials to the court, uh, sort of to the jail or the police station where he was believed, where he was being held. They believed he was being held, and it turns out that he actually was. Uh, and they were told that he wasn't there. And again, at the end of this, when they were finally backed into a corner where they couldn't ignore the courts anymore, they shoved him on a plane, re revoked his citizenship, and deported him to Canada. Um, so there's an interview I found on uh, that someone else captured from CBC News Network, which is an interview with Maguna Maguna. I won't play the video right now, but I will put a link in the description if you'd like to watch that as well. Uh, I just wanted to point out that this is not coming from C CBC's actual YouTube channel, uh, and this is one of those things that absolutely should have been, um, but it doesn't look like they post their news network pro content onto YouTube. Uh, and this will be something I'm going to come back to a little later as well, because I've got, as people who've watched some of my videos know, I've got some major beasts with the way CBC operates online. Uh, but again, well, that's enough for this story. I'll, I'll move on. But essentially, he's, uh, just to give you the update this week, um, Maguna Maguna, was the courts have finally directed the government that they have to give back his passport. They have to revoke his revocation of, of, so essentially give him back his Kenyan citizenship and allow him back in the country. Uh, as far as I know, that has, he's still in, in Toronto, um, but uh, that is the current state of that issue. It's an ongoing crisis, essentially, a showdown between the government and the media and the, and the courts. Um, so I'm curious to see how it goes. I ho I'm, hopefully this resolves and hopefully he gets back and things can go back to normal, but Anyway, that's, that's what's going on in Kenya and in Africa in general. Um, all right, I'm going to wrap this up here. Thanks very much for watching. Um, like I said, I'm going to try and do this on a bit of a regular basis. Um, oh, before I go, sorry, let me just highlight the videos that I have posted in the last week, um, if you are interested. Uh, so I've posted a number of videos this week. This is certainly my most productive week. Um, I starting back uh, with I did a critique of the CBC interview of Jordan Peterson um, breaking down how I think there were some flaws in the way that the interview was exercised um, I also started in on a Channel 4 interview this is a very famous interview that broke in the middle of January with Jordan Peterson uh, where the interviewer really did not do a very good job um, but I'm going to come back to this next week um, and I'll probably uh, well, but this is just sort of a little introduction. The next video I did was one which is a review of a video I shot um, of a lecture. This reporter, Kai Nagata, he was a reporter for CTV. Uh, he just quit CTV. He had also done work for CBC as well in the past. Um, and it was him talking about the state of news. And this was back in 2011, but many of the subject topics that he talks about, in fact, everything he's talking about is still relevant today, if not even more so. Uh, but he talks about the the de degradation of television news and uh, and just the state of where news is today. Uh, really interesting to watch. I'll be referring to this in other content later on. And the last thing I did was a uh, sort of a highlight of Florida, the Florida school shooting. Um, this is a typical type of news that I don't view as being 
actual news. Uh, this, especially for uh, news on a national or international scale. This is something that's a regional issue. It should not have been covered, not in the way that it's covered anyway. I mean, you, certainly if you want to report some of the basic facts, it's welcome to, but as you'll see in some of the video clips I pull from here from uh, some security professionals as well as this clip from a, a TV show called Newswipe from years ago uh, talk, covering another shooting in Germany in this in the situation but covering many of the same things. That there are certain things that media should not be doing to sensationalize these events because by sensationalizing it you inspire the next shooting and you know the media has a responsibility to not be create the news and it shouldn't be part of the news and, and by it's not so much covering what you're covering but how you cover it can affect real world events and can cause real tragedies and that type of introspection and self-awareness is missing in news coverage these days so anyway if you find any of those topics interesting please go check them out uh, they're on my YouTube channel. Just click on the videos. You can see all the recent ones I, I linked. And I also have on my homepage, there's a uploads, which will show you the most recent videos. Anyway, thanks very much. Uh, I will wrap this up here. But uh, just if you uh, do like this video, please subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell if you want to see notifications when I post new content. Uh, and I will see you next time. Thank you.